Thank you very much for <laughs> inviting me at this very uncertain times. And I think that uh, my approach will tell you quite clearly that I should have been the last presenter because of chronologically Islam is the youngest of the three Abrahamic traditions. So we, sh we could have started off with Judaism and then come to Christianity and then to Islam. Um, the idea of the future of the community, the future of humanity has been central to the Quran. Um, although I would say, I think I would confess that um, messianic, uh, messianic hope is not part of the Quranic understanding of salvation. Salvation depends upon human belief and human good conduct. So that's what the Quran would emphasize, that in order for you to be saved, what you need to do is believe correctly and act correctly. And that's how you become saved. So there is no direct idea in the Quran that one can say that this is the idea that would surely support messianic claims of the Muslim Mahdi coming in different times and different contexts in the Islamic history. We read about the Mahdi of India, we read about the Mahdi of Sudan, we read about, you know, different movements that are futuristic. They're trying to tell us that the future will be something that will be a correction of the past history. And it is an ideal future because that's where we need to look for the messianic signs. So all the apocalypse, all the traditions dealing with the hereafter, with the last days, they all are telling us about something that will happen in the future uh, without having any, what I call, uh, sanction in the Quran itself saying that that's the only way you will be saved. So there is no, it's, it's not a central idea in the Muslim creed to say that there will be a Messiah coming in the future and who will then deliver you because even the Prophet himself, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was himself known as Nabi Akhru Zaman, the prophet of the last days. And there was already an expectation because in Medina, in Yathrib, there was already Jewish communities talking about the coming of Messiah, coming back of someone to deliver them. So it was not unconnected. There was already a feeling for Muhammad in the uh, among the different peoples that here is someone who has been promised in the, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures and he has come to save us and this and that. So there were ideas floating in the air about messianic mythology, which actually did point to Muhammad himself to be the Messiah, that he is the one who has come at the last moment and he's going to be the one to save the humanity from the final disaster, from the final, you know, examination. So you do come across these ideas and, but no, what I want to emphasize is that nothing is really um, written in stone. You don't find traditions at that time to tell us that there is an idea of messianic separate being other than Jesus, because the Quran does introduce Jesus as Kalimatullah. He is the word of God. He is the Logos who will come when the Sa'a, when the hour will be declared. In other words, there is already an idea in the Quran that there will be, Jesus will be coming as the Logos and he will be the one to usher the messianic age in the future. Now, during all this period, by the way, you find that there was something that was promised in the Quran. And this is my thesis. I must say that my thesis goes back to the searching of the Quran to find out what exactly does it say 
that the end of history will be marked by the appearance or reappearance of the Messiah. This was my, my search when I was doing my PhD in the University of Toronto. This is what I was looking for. Where would I find evidence to tell me this is exactly what it is, that the Quran is presenting us with the idea of the future savior who will correct the mistakes of the past rulers, who will establish the rule of justice and equity. That was the idea, that there will be a political order that will be ideal. It will be public order that would be carrying the emblems of justice and equity. Fine. But does the history really end up having that requirement or not? And my research took me through the Quran. What I discovered in the Quran was that success was measured in the, among the Muslim community in terms of its ability to establish an ideal public order. There was an idea that the, the Prophet was not only the founder of the new religion, but he was also the leader of a new public order. The new Sharia then was required so that he would be able to teach his own followers the ideal rule that he was going to establish. And I think that in an early document, Mithaq al Madina, which has been translated as Constitution of Medina, in, in that document we do see, by the way, the attempt of the Prophet in Medina itself, in that city, to include Jewish tribes as part of the Ummah. This is very interesting, because at that time it would have been quite easier for the Prophet to say that, you, if you don't follow me, you don't accept me as the Prophet, you are out, you are not part of the community. No, I think what we have is a very interesting a document of civil organization, whereby Muhammad's authority would be accepted as the leader of Medina without accepting his prophethood. And the Jewish tribes were part of that, you know, Ummah, because they were also included. Such and such Jewish tribe is part of the Ummah. Such and such Jewish tribe is part of the Ummah. That means they are accepting Muhammad's political authority without submitting to his religious claim of being a prophet. This is very interesting. And this is what we call and I think many sociologists of religion have paid attention to this document. I've recently seen a PhD from University of Sydney in Australia, where a student has tried to study this document in order to establish the veracity of the document, its authenticity, and also draw the larger conclusions that we have not drawn. Montgomery Watt, in his book, uh, Muhammad at Medina, did speak about it. I think those two volumes are still worth reading, Muhammad at Mecca and Muhammad at Medina. And although, you know, we might disagree with some of his conclusions, but I think it's absolutely right that there was some idea there that Muhammad was trying to establish a public order that was not going to be a normal religious order, but rather be an order that I would call today with elements of secularity. That means saying that I, Muhammad, am the prophet for this community. You don't have to accept that about me, but you have to accept my authority as the ruler of this community, or the ruler of the Medina. I think this was remarkable. And in, in my book on ethics, I have touched upon this whole idea of what exactly the civil association meant in the early days. Although it is still within the tribal structure, I don't want to overlook and impose a modern category on the classical age. But I do realize that there is some element there that you, you and I can underline as messianic hope. What exactly was the messianic hope in the Quran, the way it presented? And I think what I find to be true is that messianic hope in the Quran was the Abrahamic idea that Judaism came with. Because the Jewish idea is the most senior idea when you talk about justice. 
And the Jewish, I think, contribution to the world civilization is that idea of universal justice. And I think that idea was central to the Quran. And I, I think that, that I, I could cite so many verses of the Quran here, but I, I'm, I'm going to keep that to minimum because I'm, I'm not, my, my purpose is at the moment to tease ideas so that I can get some very probing questions from you. That how exactly do I, where, where do I come from? And how do I come to that conclusion? And I, I must say that my, con my conclusion I will talk about later on, but there is a strong idea of messianic age in the Quran. And that messianic age is the one in which justice and equity are going to be predominant characteristics of the human public order. What human beings are assigned by the divine is that they need to take upon themselves to build a society which is accepting the principle of justice and equity as the cornerstone of their human relationships. In other words, human relationships could not be just, you know, wishy-washy, okay, you are a believer, I'm a non-believer, and all of these things. Yes, we do have that classification from the very early days. There is, there is a group of kafir, there is a group of non-believers, there is a group of polytheists, but there is generally a group of humanity that is connected to one another. And how is this going to be? And I think this, Qad Amar Rabbi Bil Qist, my Lord has ordered me, has commanded me to rule with justice, to deal in justice. Qist is, you know, distributive justice. In other words, that's the main goal that Muhammad is trying to preach. Now, what we have is, as soon as Muhammad dies, there is this, what we call, and again, the, I'm talking about my thesis. My, the, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be so many disagreements. My fellow Muslims might not even agree with me, but here it is. If I'm daring enough to you know, present it, that my thesis is that as soon as Muhammad passed away, the whole idea of ideal society built on justice and equity was threatened through the Arabic, Arab tribal rivalry. Now there were questions about if Muhammad is a member of the Hashemites and he has attained the prophethood, we will not let the caliphate go into the same tribe. We'll have our tribe to take the dominant role. In other words, there was already, you know, 23 years of Muhammad's preaching had not changed the way the Arabs used to think about their own, you know, stratification and their own tribal culture. Their tribal culture was still important for them. And that resulted into what we call the atrocities that led to the 10th of Muharram in the year 61 Hijrah, when the grandson of the Prophet was martyred, was killed. You can see how the history continued and tribalism reasserted its own identity. What Muhammad wanted to create as Ummah was a very different principle that you, my community, will be guided by your guidance that is coming from revelation and you will be following me as your, as, as your, you know, as your leader and that's what you will do. And there will be no blood relationship really going back the way Semitic anthropology would have argued about it. No, I think there was going to be somehow supplanted with a new community that was built upon faith and righteous work. So you find that that dream got lost. The three volumes that Marshall Hodgson has written about venture of Islam, in the first volume he tells us about how the Islamic State was created. It's amazing, this historian of Islam, this historian of the Middle East is remarkable in the way he tells us the story, the narrative of how the caliphate turned into a state political entity. And how did it manage its affairs? Under those circumstances, there were those 
who opposed that government, by the way. They were pious. He calls them pious opposition to the caliphate. These were the ones who did not want the caliphate to be simply based on the tribal principle that only certain members of Quraysh can rule and nobody else can rule. All of these ideas were now being challenged. Indeed, though in that movement, by the way, the personal piety of the people, as Marshall Watson tells us, was dictated through a commitment to create a public order that was ideal. What did the Prophet want us to do? You know, this is, by the way, we are talking about the first hundred years, and now the Abbasids are coming to power. Umayyads have already done their work, whatever they wanted to do, and now the new, the other tribe is coming with. And this is the prophetic tribe. They are the Hashemites. They are the ones, you know, who are claiming that we are the ones who are going to deliver the promise that Allah has made, you know, that we'll have justice and equity on earth. Little wonder Abbasids, in the beginning, even took the titles of messianic figures, Al-Mahdi. This was the son of Harun al-Rashid, you know, Al-Mahdi, Al-Amin, all of this, as safa the one who kills, the one who sheds blood of the, of the wrongdoers. All of these things were really working up towards the idea of messianism in some very, very important way that they, the Umayyad rule, started because I was searching for the first use of the word Mahdi. When did it appear? My question was, if we are going to look at the later traditions in the third century, then we are, we are very late in talking about Messiah. We need to go back to the earlier period to find out who exactly is the Mahdi. What is the expectation of the people? Who are, they, who are they seeing the equality of the messianic figure, the one who will save the world, and the Mahdi, the grandchild of the Prophet? By this time, it was already clear that only the seed of the Prophet will assume that title. So you have the blessed seed claiming to be the savior. Not only that, I think the blessed seed was the one who was going to deliver the community from its miserable situation at that time. Umayyad period towards the end was chaotic. That's when the Abbasid revolution took place. And Abbasid revolution took place on the very idea of messianic revival. Because we find that in Palestine, in Palestine, we find that there were, the opposition to the Umayyad rule was by those who claimed to be Messiah, who claimed to be Mahdi ibn al-Mahdi, the son of Mahdi. And this is, by the way, Muhammad al hanafiya the son of Imam Ali, with, uh, and the mother was a different woman, not Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. Muhammad al hanafiya was a, a very major figure, and his son Abu Hashim, was the one who had followers in Palestine. So you look at this history, by the way, and you go to Khorasan, you go to Iran, you go to other places, and you find out what exactly is going on in the society. And the society is already churning the idea of a future coming of the Mahdi, the future coming of the Messiah who can help us. Because the Arab treatment of the Persian was another matter, that they did not treat the Persian Muslims with with equality. They said they are lesser Muslims because they are not Arabs. In other words, there was this idea floating in the Arab minds under the Umayyads. I'm talking about the first hundred years, 650 to 750. And during this time, the idea was that the Arabs were supposed to be Muslims. Non-Arabs were not, you know, invited to become. If they did become, they were, they were given the title of the client, the Mawali. So they were the client of this tribe or that tribe. So they were absorbed under the tribal system, but there was no way for them to say that we were equal with Arabs, because Arabs dominated. So you find that under those circumstances, 
the idea of Mahdi. And I find the first reference about Mahdi was about Hussein ibn Ali, Imam Hussein. This was the first one, and somebody tells us, by the way, that during the early days when Hussein was traveling from Medina to Mecca, in Mecca, Farazdak, the poet, very famous Arab poet, Farazdak, he is meeting Amr bin Abdullah bin As. And you know, this Abdullah bin uh, Amr ibn As, you know, is looking for Hussein. Where is Hussein encamped? Because he was encamped outside Mecca to be safe from any kind of intrigue inside. He said, you know, Farazdak has told me that Hussein is the Mahdi and he is going to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And he is the one who will be the Messiah to come. It's very interesting that uh, when Hussein was killed, Suleiman bin Surat, according to Tabari again, tells us that he came to visit the grave of Hussein and said, Ya Mahdi ibn al-Mahdi. So he was connecting the Mahdi not only to Hussein, but also to his father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. They were both Mahdi. Mahdi in the sense of ideal ruler of the Islamic rule. So Mahdi is achieving what we call a very specific identity, that he is the, not only the seed of the prophet, but he is the one who is going to unite all the Muslims. He is the one who is going to establish the rule of justice and equity. I can go on and on and cite so many areas that I discovered in my research. But I want to come to a conclusion here. In other words, the idea was homegrown. Margoliot, in his article on Mahdi in the old encyclopedia of ethics and religion, tells us that this was something coming from the Jewish and Christian sources. I don't deny that, by the way, because the idea that was prevalent in Iraq, Iraq was quite, you know, varied community. Iraq was, did not only have the Arabs, but the Persians and, you know, the, uh, the Christians and Chalian Christians. All, there were different communities in, in Iraq. So it was, it was not homogenic community, it was heterogeneous. And they were all there with their own ideas. And therefore, I do, I do submit that, yes, I think there was a possibility of what we call cross-cultural fertilization of the idea. They were getting more information. And when I looked upon my sources, and I tried to look at the sources that were describing the early period of Abbasid age, 758 onward, and I found that the Abbasids were using all the language that was now part of the Messianic language to bring about legit legitimate acceptance of their own rule. And that's the beginning of the idea of Mahdi, the way I try to work out in my sources. In other words, what I'm saying is that the idea is thoroughly Quranic, that human beings will try time and again to establish justice and equity on earth. They will not succeed without God's help. God will intervene in the history. Very Hegelian type of, you know, you need a greater power, you know, to take the reins of the authority on earth so that there could be changes there. And I think what I found to be, I, I have all of these are, by the way, in my book, my first book in 1980, who got me into trouble, you know, because of writing that book. But so, certainly I think the trouble that I got into it myself is that my approach was historical. I couldn't proceed without taking history very carefully. And history was teaching me that, look, it's not as easy as what the community believes. Rather, you must try to examine all the situations, all the cultural, sociological, psychological, anthropological, all of these situations in order for you to understand this is why these people were believing in this or that. Doctrinal 
support, as I tried to prove in my book, was that was not without social and cultural, you know, um, uh, background to it. Doctrines were informed by so many groups, and I think until now, if you if you if you look at the story of Sudan of Mahdi, for ex Mahdi of Sudan, for example, in the 19th century, you know, when the British were controlling, you know were already in Sudan. I think that time, if you understand it very carefully, there was a political dimension to it, more that than the theological one. Because by that time, it was already known that the Mahdi will be from the children of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. By that time, it was already known that Hussein's children will inherit this title. Then how did it happen that the Mahdi of Sudan was neither connected to the family of the Prophet nor connected to any of the, you know, earlier figures, was able to create the havoc? And the British had to fight him. You know, they really needed to, otherwise it would have been a mess. And, you know, Egypt was, was going to follow after that. So here you find that I think there are so many historical facts that we need to examine before we understand the futurist theology. The futurist theology is partly generated by dissatisfaction about the status quo. The dissatisfaction with the status quo was that, okay, we had this ideal caliphate of the Rashidun, the first caliphate, four caliphate, and then we have this kingship of the Umayyads, and then we have these pretenders of the Sharia supporters, the Abbasids, because that's what they did. Sharia becomes a very important part of Muslim identity under the Abbasids. The Umayyads were more interested in keeping them under the Arab ages, and you know, under the Arab you know, identity. And therefore, there was very little attempt to you know, try to bring about juridical changes or juridical, you know, codification. Nothing was done under them, but the Abbasids took over. And their legitimacy was built upon, upon their commitment to the Sharia. In, in my very last concluding remarks, I must say that the topic is open to all kinds of discussions and research could continue for a long time to come. I don't think we have closed the, you know, the subject as yet. I think it's open, you know, for students to, I have been requested from Iran to write a book on the other side of the idea of Mahdi, you know, how does one believe in the Mahdi? What, what is it that the prerequisites are for us, for the Mahdi to come back? In other words, how should we be preparing ourselves for the Mahdi to reappear? In other words, there is a religious dimension they are looking for me. And I don't know why I was approached because I did stand out as a very controversial figure in the beginning. But I think, I think some of my thesis was somehow sustained, you know, by other research. That they were, I, I still did, I, I still did what the Orientalists would have done, you know. And I did go through the textual information and getting into the hermeneutics of the text and trying to see how this could be connected. And what was Tabari doing? What was Masudi doing? What was Abul Fidar? All of these historians. And, and also, I, I, I studied a lot, by the way, what I call the heresiographers, those who wrote Kitab al Milal, those who wrote about sex and sectarianism. And they discussed a lot about these ideas that I'm talking about. But what I found to be a very important note in all of them was that there was one idea that somehow covered most of these movements and most of these claimants to the authority of the Mahdi was to establish justice and equity. It was very interesting to see. There was a political demand on them so there was, even the Zanj revolution in Ahwaz, you know, in the, you know, that also the, the revolution of the black, you find elements of Mahdism even there in the pronouncement of the leaders, what they said about it. Anyways, I'll stop so that you can prove me.